Hi everyone, welcome back to Five Code Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, Act 1. Today we will be finishing up the act with scene 5. It is the big party scene when Romeo spots Juliet and the lovers fall instantly in love, of course. It's the party scene. Capulet welcomes his guests and he laments the swift passing of time, which is which becomes a dominant, th one of the themes of, of the play. Tybalt spots Romeo, of course, and vows swift action against his foes. The two lovers fall in love and Juliet plays it quite coy and quite clever, but... Of course, she enjoys Romeo's attentions. The scene opens with a description of the preparations for the party. There's a lot of hubbub going on as they get ready. Then Capulet welcomes his guests and he starts to reminisce very briefly about his olden days when he used to uh, wear a visor and go to parties himself. And then he laments the passing of time. Tis gone, tis gone, tis gone. He does it again down here and it occurs at some other places throughout the play, which makes it a, a bit of a minor theme. Now, the thing that I find interesting about this, and I'm not quite sure where Shakespeare's going with it, is that he, remember the play Play, this play is Shakespeare's great statement of youth, but you can't talk about youth unless you have something to compare it to, so you, you compare it to old age. Well, with the introduction of this motif theme, it seems like Shakespeare's saying that, yeah, old people experience the swift passing of time, but young people experience it as well. Capulet's 60 years old, and it, he feels like his life went by in a flash. That's what we feel when we get older. Well, look at this. Romeo's life is going by in a flash, and it only takes three days. So I don't know what Shakespeare's saying here. It's how we experience time over a 60-year period or condensed into three days. The, the, this, the action of the play, by the way, takes place in three days, which is remarkable. They fall in love and, and, and get married and die, you know, in the space of three days. So it's something to think about. You might want to dig into that a bit further, but it is a minor theme, but I, I find it very interesting. So Romeo spots Juliet and oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. So here we come back to our light imagery. I'm sorry, you're going to get bored of hearing this, but it's all throughout the play. You can't avoid it. And why? Well, it kind of connects with what I just said about the passing of time. Youth burning bright too quickly burns itself out. Youth burning too brightly, the fire imagery, uh, you, you can't avoid it. It's really what, what happens here. Like I said, three days. Um, Related to this, we, we, we can also attach it to love is infatuation. It's just, it's a flame that, that, you know, dynamite that just explodes and then disappears immediately. Connected to this is maybe even a better quote for your essays would be something like this. Uh, Did my heart love till now, forswear its sight, for I ne'er saw true beauty until this night. Laughable, unbelievably laughable. I wish Benvolio could hear this. He'd be splitting his sides. Um, of course, love is infatuation. Romeo as an adolescent in love with his own feelings uncontrollable feelings, he's impetuous, he's all emotion and absolutely zero thought. Right away, we are reintroduced to Tybalt and he notices Romeo and notices that Romeo is one of the Montagues and he's furious. Now by the stock in honor of my kin to strike him dead, I hold it not a sin. Now, if you're in the hands of a, of a genius, if you're, if you're studying a masterpiece, then Rhymes like this are not accidental. The The poet will, will deliberately choose to rhyme word A with word B because there should be some kind of connection to them. Well, look what he's saying. He's rhyming sin with kin, with family and sin. Down here, Romeo and Juliet begin uh, uh, in earnest uh, uh, a description of love as sacred and holy. And they play on this notion of the ability of physical touch, physical love, love to purge our sins. So here we see love as the purger of sins. The love is the purifier. That goes back to our wasteland theme, the he love, the healer. And over here, we see that in stark contrast, we see sin in the service of hate. Do you see this? He thinks that it, it, I, I should, I am, I am honor bound and it is not a sin in the eyes of God if I murder my enemies. Well, obviously, this quote is useful for your, you know, to, to prove that Tybalt's a hothead, but that's, not, that's the least interesting thing, I think, here. Cycle of revenge, obviously. The kinship, the blood, blood libels and blood, you know, feuds. That, that old cycle that I talked about in, in, my, in my theme video. In-group, out-group, of course. Kin being the in-group. And as soon as you put someone in your in-group, you'll die for them. And as soon as you put someone in your out-group, you'll feel justified in murdering them. Yeah, you see how far that goes. Okay, it's a very interesting quote, and, and I think it strikes to the heart of 
Shakespeare's theme in this whole play, which is um, uh, the, the 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 senselessness of in group out group rivalry, and we'll that we'll continue talking about this. This next quote, I think, is the most important quote to help us understand Romeo's character. He is the worthy hero. Tybalt wants to destroy the villain, of course, but the more measured, wiser, less biased, and 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 less angry older man says. Uh, Content thee, gentle cuz, let him alone. He bears him like a portly gentleman, and to say truth, Verona brags of him to be a virtuous and well-governed youth. Now, if you remember your, 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 your high school classes, um, when you were doing character analysis, you don't listen to what they say because they could be lying to themselves and to others. You look at a character's actions, and we do look at Romeo's actions, and that's how we're piecing together an analysis of him. You also listen to what other people say about them. Now, you have, to, you have to determine whether or not we can trust those other people. So can we trust what Capulet says here about Romeo? I think we can, because Capulet's his enemy, and he's saying these lovely, honorable things about his enemy. And if that's the case, then the, the, it's, I think it's pretty trustworthy. So I think this is, this is proof that, that Romeo's love, as foolish as it is, is coming from the right place. He's well known as a decent guy. He is the worthy hero. He's above in-group, out-group nonsense. And Capulet recognizes that. It's quite interesting. Romeo leads with love. It's coming from the right place. He's not lying to himself. He's not lying to others, as misguided and, and naive as his love may be. So we, we can ask ourselves, why, why isn't Benvolio the worthy hero? Well, maybe he's not earnest enough in his love. D do you see? Romeo is willing to go all the way, which is both his fault and his, uh, and his virtue, I think. Mercutio, of course, is not the worthy hero because he's, he's, he's too cynical. So, so, of course, that's connected to the hero's quest motif uh, in that we do have, we do have the chosen one. So we might want to actually like Capulet here, but he immediately undermines himself when he uh, when he's outraged that Tybalt dared to challenge his authority, Tybalt insists that they destroy Romeo, and he says, no, 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 you go to, go to, you saucy boy. Um, I like to point this out to students because when, when we're reading literature and, and we form an opinion of a character, we might like them or dislike them, and all of a sudden you get some evidence that contradicts that original notion. Well, that's important to pay attention to because what, what's happening in those situations is that you're, you're not in the hands of, of a lazy writer. You're in the hands of a writer who wants to depict humanity in its fullest. Okay, characters aren't all black and white. Characters aren't all good or bad. There's, there's, we are complicated creatures and a true artist will, will enjoy exploring that. So um, stay on your guard, stay on your guard. Don't be lazy. Now begins one of the great scenes in all of literature. Romeo takes Juliet's hand, looks into her eyes, and says, If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle fine is this, my lips to blushing pilgrims ready stand to soothe that rough touch with a tender kiss. Now he starts off with this whole um, conceit. It's, it's, they're, they're playing a little game. He imagines that she is a shrine. She's a, she's a statue, okay, a stone statue, and she's of the Holy Virgin Mary, of, of the Madonna. Now that's significant in itself because as we've talked about several times already, that Romeo's love is true, it's honest, it's sincere. He sees it as something that is sacred. Now there's an old uh, medieval notion that that love indeed was sacred. It was the it was, and and physical love, sexual intercourse was actually a consummation of a divine, spiritual love, and and you couldn't separate the two. Physical and spiritual love were actually one, and we're seeing a version of this here in in because uh, Shakespeare was writing shortly after the Middle Ages, and so there's lots of Middle Age notions floating around in in the Elizabethan mind. So he sees Juliet as a shrine. She sees he sees her as something holy and spiritual. It's and again, it's the it's the contrast in the imagery, the way that he sees women compared to the way Mercutio does, and compared to the way the thugs at the beginning of the play depict um, depict women. It's it's absolutely horrible. So he imagines that that she's a shrine. A statue in a, a holy statue in, in the shrine, and he arrives, and he's a pilgrim, so he's he's making a journey to this holy place. He and 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 
he would touch the 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 stone the stone hands of the goddess and and give his pay his respects that way and he he apologizes to this statue for i'm sorry my rough hand is is too crude for your divine presence but i will try to make amends by by kissing it with a tender kiss and look at the language look at the language it's absolutely it's it's beautiful he is the worthy hero he's a tender boy he's a lovely boy fool for sure but a lovely boy and as we'll see now juliet returns this uh this 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 notion um, right away Without missing a beat, Juliet says, Good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much, which mannerly devotion shows in this. For saints have hands that palm that pilgrims' hands do touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. Now the holy palmer is another word for the pilgrim, and because they used to carry palm, like a palm frond, a palm leaf, they used to carry that on their pilgrimage. And what she's saying here is that, you know, don't worry about your rough hands, because when pilgrims meet the goddess they don't kiss anyway they palm to palm they they the head they touch the hands and that's what a pilgrim that's that's a, that's the kiss of a pilgrim to the goddess so she immediately jumps into this she plays into the game there's a willing participation in this game of love this this very serious game of love so i i do believe that that this is demonstration and it bears it out further in the play that juliet is an equal partner in this worthy hero-ness. You can't have the union of opposites. I think I've mentioned before in, in the theme video, the, it's the union of opposites that heals the wasteland. The male and the female principles must be united, that union of opposites. And she is the female principle without which there is no rejuvenation of, of, of the cosmos, of, of, of at least the human in, in the human imagination. So she is a willing participant. She is the, 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 the worthy hero. She participates in, this, in this, this notion that love is holy, that, that marriage is sacred and necessary. It also demonstrates, however, that she's quite, she's very witty and, and guarded and clever. She's, she's mocking Romeo a bit here. He's kind of being cheesy and over the top with his attempts to woo and seduce her. And she's playing along, but she's playing it very, very coy, do you see? She says, no, we don't have to kiss. You know, you, a, a pilgrim doesn't have to kiss the shrine. It's just the hands are enough, dear sir. Um, again, here you could use this quote to demonstrate that. I, pilgrim, lips that they must use in prayer. So Romeo's trying to argue that, well, you know what? Saints have lips. You know, the, the statue of the Madonna has lips, and so do the pilgrims. I have lips. So it's almost a, it's almost a variation of this uh, I'm a boy and you're a girl kind of thing. And she says, yes, of course, you have lips, fine, but use them in prayer. So again, she's, she's witty, she's clever, she's guarded, but she's also not excluding herself from this, this worthy endeavor, the domain of the lovers, the union of opposites. It's, 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 quite, it's quite remarkable. Despite the gentle rebuke, Romeo gently presses forward. She doesn't say no. She says, saints, statues don't move but they do grant for prayer's sake. So she says, I'm not gonna say no, but I'm not gonna say yes. We've seen that before when Juliet was talking to her mother. Then Romeo says, then move not while my prayer's effect I take. And he kisses her, lovely scene, lovely scene. And what's the result? Thus from my lips by yours, my sin is purged. We are redeemed by love. That's the message of this line. It's very, very different than how we, we saw sin up here. It's almost as if for Tybalt, uh, we are redeemed by hate. We are redeemed by murder. And in the old blood for blood, in-group, out-group cycle of violence, we are redeemed by hatred. We are redeemed by the fulfillment of our hatred in murder. Now look at Romeo's and Juliet's. Now we can add Juliet to this um, idea of redemption. It's through love. Beautiful. Then have my lips the sin that they have took. So she says, oh, you gave me your sin. I'm polluted now. I have the cheese touch, if you remember those, those old books. Sin from my lips, oh, trespass sweetly urged. Give me my sin again. So they exchange this. Love the great redeemer. Let me just walk you through the rest of this scene very quickly. They do kiss, and Juliet teases Romeo about how formal his kissing is, as if she's dissatisfied with it. Before Romeo gets a chance to respond, however, the nurse comes in and says, your mother wants you. 
Romeo asks the nurse, who was that lady I was talking to? And the nurse says, that was the daughter of the house. And I tell you, he that can lay hold of her shall, have, shall be in the money. Now, this is not an accident. Shakespeare puts this in here to contrast, to highlight the, the, the idea of love as holy, spiritual, and sacred, the redeeming factor in human existence. The nurse can't see that at all. She sees love only as a business arrangement. And again, that, that, that is supported by what we've seen already with Tybalt. It's framed. This lovely, holy scene is framed by the violence of Tybalt and the real world, mundane world, profane world of the nurse's idea of love as simply a business arrangement. This is a good quote. Oh, oh dear account, my life is my foe's debt, but there's a better one down here. Benvolio says, let's go. Capulet says, good night, everyone. And then this is interesting for the character of Juliet. Juliet, as all of, all of the guests are leaving, Juliet wants to ask, who's that guy that I was just with? She can't ask the nurse that, though, because that will make the nurse suspicious. So she says, who's that guy? Oh, and who's that guy? And oh, who, by the way, who is that guy? And of course, it's Romeo. That's the only thing she wants to know. And the nurse says, of course, that it's, that it's Romeo. Uh, well, no, sorry. She, she goes and she, she asks who Romeo was. And as the nurse is gone asking, Juliet says this, and it's a good quote too, but I don't know if I want to talk about it too much. If he be married, my grave is like to me my wedding bed. So there's that, that oxymoronic statement. There's the paradox, there's the, which, which lies at the heart of the play, the dual nature of love. It's both life-giving and life-destroying. Then comes the most important quote here. My only love sprung from my only hate, which is what I just mentioned. It's love as both healer and destroyer, dualism. We could use it as evidence that Juliet is like Romeo, adolescent, impetuous, and emotional. She comes off as much more clever. At the beginning, she's much more clever than Romeo, which is usually the case with, 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 with teenage boys and girls. Girls mature faster, and boys are these big, goofy dogs, doggy kind of characters, and women are, are a bit, uh, girls are a bit, a, a bit more reserved and clever, maybe more like a feline, cat-like figure, to use the stereotypes. Uh, okay, so there it is. Great scene. And that's the end of Romeo and Juliet, Act 1, Scene 5. It's the end of Act 1. Come back for my next video, Act 2, Scene 1, where we see the boys reuniting after the party. And, of course, Mercutio mercilessly teases our noble hero. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.